you're in this room, welcome. We're so glad that you are here. You know, we are in week three of the summer road trip series through the book of Philippians. And um, I want to tell you, I actually don't like road trips at all. Um, a, Four hours max is like, that's what I do as far as road trips. Um, And I think it was because growing up, we, um, I lived in New York and my grandparents were in Florida and my other set of grandparents were in Indiana. And that was just torturous sharing the back seat with my two siblings. And so um, I think that's where my hate of road trips came. Um, But I do love traveling slowly through the Bible. And um, last week, Pastor Brendan finished up Philippians 1, chapter 1, and what an anointed message. And so if you did not get a chance to hear it, go catch it online this week. Um, Just a powerful message. Um, And so this kind of preaching or teaching, when you go through the Bible verse by verse, the word for that is is called exegetical, and just meaning that we're simply going to go through it And so today we're starting in the second chapter of Philippians, and we're going to go through the first half of it. And so um, for verses 1 and 2, I actually chose the Passion Translation. It's a very modern-day version of the Bible. And so if you're new to your faith, um, maybe that might be a good one to dig into, or even the message um, are just easy uh, ways to read through the Bible. And so Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2 out of Passion says this, Look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the anointed one. You are filled to overflowing with his comforting love. You have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have felt his tender affection and mercy. So I'm asking you. And remember, this is Paul who is asking Christ's followers when he's sitting in prison because of sharing for his faith. So Paul is asking the church of his time, Christ followers, he says this, my friends, be joined together in perfect unity. One heart, one passion, and united in one love. Walk together With one harmonious purpose, and you will fill my heart with unbounded joy. So I looked up the definition of unity in the Oxford Dictionary, and it says this. It is the state of being in agreement and working together. The state of being joined together to form one unit. I recently read this story, and I want to share it with you. Um, This happened on a beach, and uh, the people that were on the sand noticed that there was a young girl that was drowning, and so they quickly rescued her, and the little girl was unconscious. She was laying on the sand, and um, this man, older man, comes, runs to her, and he's holding the girl, and um, this other man starts pushing his way through a little furious and warned the people surrounding this girl to step aside, including this old man that had her in his arms. And he, this young man says, I was trained to do CPR. Stay out of this and let me do it. And so the old man kind of stood up. He stepped behind the guy and he watched quietly while the other guy was performing CPR on the girl. And after almost a minute, the little girl regained consciousness, and the people around him, of course, were relieved, and they began applauding the guy. And even the old man, who looked very happy, um, gratefully congratulated the guy as well. However, about two hours later, the guy who saved the girl suddenly started feeling fatigue, experiencing difficulty in breathing, and became unconscious. And a few minutes later, he woke up in the ambulance, rushing him to the nearest hospital, Beside him was the old man he saw earlier at the beach, now checking his pulse rate. And the old man did CPR on him while he was unconscious. And this time, he learned that the old man was a doctor. Why didn't you tell me you were a doctor, he said. And the doctor just smiled and answered, It doesn't matter to me whether you call me a doctor or not. A precious life is in danger. I became a doctor not for fame, but to save lives. We had the same goal, and that was to save the girl. 
there are a lot of things to be protected other than our ego. I believe that is the definition of unity as Christ followers, that we work together for the same purpose and the same goal, and we are not out for our own ego or to make a name for ourselves for Christ's sake or for heaven's sake. Remember, perfect unity is what Paul was asking for. He asked for, the fo- for Christ's followers to have one heart, one passion, and united in one love. He wants us to walk together in harmony, in purpose. See, Matthew 22 says this, and I believe this gives us in this room as Christ's followers what our purpose is. One of them was mentioned earlier today during worship is that we're to go into all the nations and make disciples. But Jesus also says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our minds. And then he says that's the first commandment. Nothing else even touches it. It's the greatest. It's the first. And the second, though, he says is like it. You're going to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the Amplified version kind of expands that and says it's unselfishly seeking the best or higher good for others. And you can't do that and be concerned with yourself at the same time. It breaks my heart, to be honest with you, that there is such a lack of unity among Christ's followers in marriages, in families, in churches, in politics. In places of employment, these places, these organizations, these institutions are no longer marked by unity, but they are marked by division. I think another reason for that is that another definition of unity is the absence of diversity. Unity is the absence of diversity. It is unvaried or uniform character. I believe we have a lack of unity because we have forgotten our identity. We think that our identity is our ethnicity. We think that our identity is our sexuality. We think that our identity is our political party. We think that our identity is what we do for a living. But our identity is absolutely none of those things. We are sons and daughters of God. That is our one and only identity. Galatians 3.28 says it like this. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. There is no male or female. Since you are all one in Christ Jesus. Our identity is Jesus and Jesus alone. He is our creator and we are his creation. He is the ultimate artist and we are his workmanship. Genesis 1.27 says it like this, that God created man in his own image. We all reflect the image of God here. The Greek word for that is amago dei. That is our identity. So the first two verses of Paul, the first two verses of Philippians are Paul asking Christ's followers to be marked by unity. I want that to, uh, for us to be our challenge, is that we walk in unity. If we move on now to the next two verses in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, and we're going to go into the NIV, the New International Version translation. It says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest but each of you to the interest of others. See, Peter Scazzaro, one of my favorite um, authors, pastors in New York City, he's wrote a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And he says that many of us are like babies. A baby screams for its mother to feed and take care of it. 
He or she is the center of the universe with others existing to care for its needs. The baby suffers from grandiosity, arrogance, and childishness. Now, I put a picture, I had them put a picture um, up, and this is baby Mariah. So we, this is uh, Bruce and Heather Knoll, they're on our staff, or she's on our staff. Um, this is their sweet little baby. She's about three months old, and we have had a baby boom on our staff. We've had three babies born in just like the last couple of months, and we have another one coming in the fall. And so I don't recommend applying for Fusion staff if you feel like your family is finished because something is sweeping through um, our staff. But yesterday we were at a get-together, and I just got to love on Mariah. But she is the center of the universe. In fact, yesterday it was very hot outside, and she was taking a nap. And there was a lot of people at this gathering, and so she got a very quiet air-conditioned spot in the, air, in the living room while the rest of the people had to deal with the heat. And as soon as she woke up screaming, her mother had freshly prepared milk for her. And as soon as she was done eating, she decided right there in front of everyone to make a very loud announcement of her dirty diaper. And of course, someone just giggles and goes, oh, that would be so wonderful to change a poopy diaper. And then I go and I just scoop up Mariah and she decides she doesn't want to sit on my lap or lay on my lap because that's just not comfortable for her. She wants me to do push presses with her in the air. And she doesn't care that I'm getting tired because that is so fun for her. And we all just oohed and awed over Mariah, making her know she is the center of the universe. There is nothing wrong for that sweet little baby that's been on earth for 12 weeks. But eventually she's going to have to grow up. And she's going to have to learn that she is not the center of the universe. And the universe does not exist to meet her every need. And I think that's a painful lesson for all of us to learn. Our egos can become so inflated that we act as if we are the God of our universe. And I think many times we have huge fantasies and desires and wishes for ourselves that our real life can't support. In fact, they're not God's desires. They're our flesh's desires. I actually have a funny story. It's not very deep at all um, about myself. But I got into gardening um, a couple of years ago. And I love it. It's, it's actually become borderline addicting for me. And so every year, my garden just gets bigger and bigger, and it's starting to really take over. In fact, my kids call it the jungle right now. And um, so last year, my husband noticed, I also hand watered this garden. So last year, uh, my husband was noticing how much time that was taking away from our family in the evenings why I have to guard, uh, hand water this massive garden. And so he said he was going to put some irrigation lines into the garden so that, you know, it wouldn't take so much time. And um, so he and my son started digging these trenches to put the water lines in. And then halfway through, we came up with a couple of other big projects that we wanted to work on in the summer. And so basically right now, we have about four or five open projects going on, none of them finished, and just these irrigation lines, you know, the trenches. And I think what Peter Scazzaro was saying is, he goes, that's why we work frantically. We're doing more than God intended. And I think that maybe if Brendan and I would have sat down at the beginning of the year and thought through, hey, we only have so much time. We have this thing called limits. We have some big responsibilities. We probably can't do all five of these projects. So why don't we decide which one's the most important? But as Peter Scazzaro says, we burn out thinking we can do more than we can. And then we get stressed and we start blaming other people. I might or might not have this week mumbled under my breath while I was hand watering my garden, I thought my husband was going to put irrigation lines in. And he might or might not have heard that 
and then responded with, yeah, and then you came up with 42,000 other things on the to-do list. See, John 15 says this, remain in me. It's Jesus talking, and I in you. And just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself, unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. I am the creator. You are the branches, the creation. The one who remains in me and I in him will produce a lot of fruit because you can do nothing without me. We are completely dependent upon Jesus. So some of us, I think we become depressed because our desires are so high and unachievable that it seems useless to do anything at all. Let's just be honest. A part of us hates limits. In fact, some of us don't even accept them. Let me give you some examples. Sabbath. Tithing. You know, believe it or not, do you know that those are commands in the Bible? To work six days, and the seventh day is to be set aside as worship unto God and for rest. Tithing actually means 10% of everything that we make is to be brought into the local church, the unified body of Christ. Let me give you some examples in the Bible. Hebrews 4, 9 through 10 says this. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Sabbath rest is a gift that the people of God should be participating in. We shouldn't be exhausted or burned out or not able to function. We should be high on energy if we are actually taking the 52 days of rest that God has given to us in a year. And so Hebrews 4 says, for anyone who enters into God's rest, also rests from their work, just as God did from his. Or Hebrews 4.11 says this, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish, become exhausted, clinically burned out, depressed by following the example of disobedience. Or what about this one in Proverbs 3, 9 through 10? It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Or Malachi 3, we've heard so many times before, says, how will a mere mortal, a man, a woman, rob God? And yet you rob me, but you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So my question to you today as a Christ follower in this room, if you are a Christ follower, how's your finances? And if you're sitting there saying, it's not good, my follow next follow-up question would be, how's your tithing? I want to ask, do we believe or trust God that he can do more with our 90% than we can do with our 100%? Or can I say it like this? Do we see ourselves as the branch and him as the vine? God placed a limit on us that we re will allow us to remain humble and dependent upon him at all times. Every time we get a paycheck, he wants us to give part of it back to him so that we remain humble and dependent upon the Lord all 365 days of the year. Do we trust God that he can do more with our six days than we can do with our seven? He says, remain in me. Remember who's the vine. Remember who is the branch. And if you remain, you're going to produce 
a lot of fruit because you can do nothing without him. So imagine this. If you're doing what you are doing now and you're doing it on your own, imagine what a lot of fruit would look like if you started honoring God with your tithes and your Sabbath. You don't even know. Probably what you're living in now is only a small fraction of the blessings of God over your life. <clears throat> I found a transcript of a radio conversation of a U.S. naval ship with the Canadian authorities, and this was off the coast of Newfoundland in October of 1995. And it went like this. The Americans say, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. And the Canadians respond, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. And then the Americans respond, this is the captain of the U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. And the Canadians respond, no. I say again, you divert your course. And the Americans come back on and say, this is the aircraft carrier, USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one, five degrees north. Or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the sh safety of this ship. And the Canadians respond, this is a lighthouse, your call. <laughs> I think Jesus is the lighthouse. We're the USS Lincoln. And in our eyes, we seem pretty important. And maybe even other people think we're important. And so we try to negotiate with God, who is the lighthouse. And say, God, you know this season right now, it's just tough financially. Like, I really want to do a family vacation or do this or do that. And so this is the season. Could we just divert the course by 15 degrees? Like, you know, there's some extra shifts and overtime coming up. And the Sabbath, that would kind of, how about we just, you know, if you can move this way just in the season. And he goes, no, that's not the way it works is that I am the lighthouse, you decide. But there is no negotiation. If we move on in Philippians 2, verse 5, it says, in your relationships with one another, have the mindset of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, the, those three verses that we just read together is now giving us the chief example of all when it comes to humility, and that is Jesus himself. Andrew Murray was a South African born in 1828. And yes, I have a very strong liking to South Africans. But he wrote an incredible book in the 1800s on humility. And he said this, it was when the serpent, Satan, breathed the poison of his pride, the desire to be as God, that is pride into the hearts of Adam and Eve that they fell from their place of prosperity and extreme peace. He says, in heaven on earth, pride or self-exaltation is the very gateway to hell. See, that is how Satan tempted Eve, was playing on her pride and her humility. In the garden, there was such humility that Adam and Eve loved being dependent upon Jesus. But Satan said, that one tree, 
The only reason he doesn't want you to eat from that is because then you'll be like him. And don't you want that? Don't you want to have the knowledge of God? Do you really want to be dependent upon God? Being dependent on yourself would be so much better. And so she ate and humility was destroyed forever. And pride entered man. All of us have been born prideful beings. We fight, we resist this dependence upon God. And so that is why Jesus came to bring humility back to earth. That he sent his son into a small teenage woman that wasn't even married. And he lived a life of humility to restore back what was stolen in the Garden of Eden. He humbled himself to become a man. See, humility is simply acknowledging the truth of our position as a created being yielding to God in his place that he is our creator. Humility is getting ourselves on the potter's wheel and allowing the potter to mold us and to make us as he intended and purposed. <laughs> Romans 9.20 says it like this, but who do you think you are to second guess God? How could a human being molded out of clay say to the one who molded him, why in the world did you make me this way? I think maybe there might be a couple of us in this room today that we are in a fight with God right now. And maybe not consciously, but it could be subconsciously. You are trying to create your own identity. You are trying to create your own person or your purpose. You are hustling, you are striving, you are pushing, you are working seven days a week and spending all 100% that you have. Your ego is getting in the way. And whether you realize it or not, it is killing the very essence of you and everything around you. We must present ourselves as empty vessels in which God can dwell and manifest his power and goodness. See, Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There will always be a tension in your life if you are trying to live for yourself because you were not made to live for yourself. You were made to be crucified and to live for Jesus. Galatians 5.24 says this, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with all of its grandiose passions and all of its desires that are impossible to meet. John 3.30, great John the Baptist says, he must increase, but I must decrease. See, I think many of us like little Mariah, which by the way, she should be the center of the universe. We get so full of ourselves. But at some point, we have to realize that this being full of ourselves leaves no room for God. And so we have to make that decision. What's my cup going to be full of? Because here's what I know. God's always pursuing us. But when there's so much of us, there's no room for him. And so humility is saying, God, this is exhausting. This is not the way you meant this is how the enemy lies to me. 
This is how he deceives me. And so, Lord, change my desires that I want to be empty of myself. So that then I'm available for him to fill me with all of him. And the more full of Jesus we are, we can kind of push ourselves off. See, Matthew 6 says this, no one can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one, oh, and you'll love yourself. You'll love your desires, your passions, the drive to work, money, fame, status. Or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and possessions. You cannot serve God and serve fame or ego or status or whatever is valued more than the Lord. See, humility is the place of entire dependence upon God. And then the last three verses in Philippians that we're looking at today, Pastor Bren's going to finish off Philippians 2 next week. But Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11 talks about Jesus being our great example of humility and how he came to serve us and to restore what was lost. And then in verse 9, it says, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility is the secret of blessedness. It is the desire to be nothing that allows God to be all in all in your life. And let me tell you a little other secret. Proverbs 10.22 says this. The good that comes from the Lord makes one rich. And let me tell you, it makes you rich in everything. In your finances, in your marriage, in your family, in your health. And then when you allow the Lord, this is a promise from the word of God. The, the, the good that comes from the Lord makes one rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. In other words, the blessings of the Lord is freedom. There's nothing attached to it. The blessings of the Lord include 52 days of vacation a year. That's it, seven and a half weeks, which I don't know very many employers giving that right now. It means that you get the wealth, you get the rest, and you get the freedom. But I want to tell you, humility is not something that will come by itself. Church is something we have to fight for. Culture is not speaking a message of humility to us. It is building up our flesh. It is building up our desire for pride, our desire to be like God. And so we must fight for our humility. We must desire our humility. We must pray and ask God a very dangerous prayer. And that is for the Lord to humble us. Because when we are empty of ourselves, we are now a vessel that is able for him to be full of him, of Jesus. So as you stand today, as we end... I didn't say this in the first for, in the first service, but I'm going to go ahead and say this now. Some of you, my 
might feel that your glass is shattered. And I want to say you might feel like you are in the darkest night of your life, but that is called your crucifixion. And after every crucifixion is a resurrection. And a crucifixion hurts. All right, Cumberland County, are you pressing in? Because this is for you too. A crucifixion hurts because the emptying of ourself and getting rid of the old wine skin and making room for a new wine skin, it definitely hurts. But what sometimes the darkest nights of our soul does is empty us of ourselves so that now we are finally in a place to be full of Jesus. So you might have feel like you've lost everything recently, but I'm here to tell you, you've lost nothing. You've only lost yourself, your flesh, and your fleshly desires. But get ready, because when there's a crucifixion, there is a resurrection, and you are in a place to be full of God. And so may that be your hope and your encouragement as you leave here tonight. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for Philippians. Thank you for Philippians 2, for Paul writing this encouraging message from jail to us that is so practical and relevant right here in our culture. And so, Lord, our prayer is, Lord, that we decrease so that you can increase. And that is the true desire of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.